Hi there. So yeah, it's part two of this presentation. We, we just thought it'd be really um, informative and interesting to provide you a bit of information about how we see quantum developing in the future and, and how we can use quantum to assist with what we're doing from a Boston medical healthcare perspective in terms of developing our algorithm. So quickly, so we, we are Boston, we're a Sakai partner. We've been 30 years in the industry, in the past, selling primarily hardware, working with different technology partners. It's important to note we, we have Boston Training Academy that train customers on AI and, algorithm, and how to develop their algorithms. <coughs> we, we, uh, we also have Boston Labs, so many organizations looking to drive quantum technologies need the bleeding edge technologies. So that's, that's what we develop within Boston Labs. When you look at the, uh, the alliances that we have, there's only a certain amount that you can do with supermicro hardware. So over the years, we've really built out our ecosystem of alliance partners. So we're actually running a session at 4.30 today um, in the, um, the Wapping Tavern. So we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have uh, Run AI there, we're gonna have Weka there, and uh, we're gonna have uh, NVIDIA too. So please come to our stand and um, you know, we can give you a pass to that event. It's gonna be really informative. Partnering with Sakai, we actually sell a quantum solution with them. So in terms of quantum random number generation versus the, um, the pseudo random number generation that you get these days. So quantum random numbers uh, provide a pure source of entropy, um, unhackable, whereas the, uh, the tr traditional methods you have these days, they, they can be manipulated to a certain extent. So uh, more, more than happy to talk to you about that as well. So. I'm a solution specialist and I work in terms of Boston Medical within the Boston group. And what we're doing at Boston is we've developed an algorithm to detect anomalies in the liver. So from a numbers perspective, about 6,000 people will be diagnosed with liver cancer over the course of the year, of which about 3,500 of those unfortunate, unfortunately will pass away. The, um, the, the, the prognosis is typically, after 10 years, you have an 8% chance of survival. So the focus on liver cancer is, uh, is, is certainly important. So we have an algorithm that we've developed for the past couple of years within Boston, and it targets three key areas. So the liver, the background, and any anomalies. Okay, so that, that's kind of an overview of uh, what we're doing there. So the question is, how can we use quantum technologies and drive our research and, and drive the needs for performance that, that we're going to have in the future? So we're kind of being a bit uh, forward thinking here. So what you see on the screen here is something called a confusion matrix. So we use this to evaluate the effectiveness of our algorithm. So as I said before, we evaluate background, we evaluate the liver, and we evaluate the anomaly. So you can see running down the middle, the higher the values, the, the, the closer to 100%, the, the better of the algorithm, okay? And we at Boston Medical, we're, we're driving between 96 and 99% at the moment, so it shows we have a really good algorithm. However, we want to start building on those levels of classification. So rather than just the anomaly, we're gonna look at things like benign tumors, malignant tumors, other issues associated with the liver, such as cirrhosis, and then potentially unlock that, open up that category as well. So as we add more in terms of classification, we then start adding more to confusion matrix. So you go from nine, you're going from nine to 16 to 25. So this all requires computational overhead. So we, we think that there's a real use case for quantum to be able to enable us to open up the scope of our analyses there. <clears throat> Second thing I'm gonna talk about is in terms of the resolution of the data that we're pulling into our algorithm. So we, we take a bunch of liver scans and we train the model based on annotated data. So we have the scans, the annotated data, we, we then train the model. Typically, those scans are in a 512 by 512 grid format. 
More recently, we're starting to see 1024 by 1024, and then with the, the invent of um, more powerful equipment, you're going to quickly see 2048, et cetera, et cetera. Also, when a, live, when, when a thorax scan takes place, normally the placement is about a millimeter between each individual scan. What happens when that starts going down to the micrometer? You know, we, we're going to start really ramping up the amount of data. So this is the, the second piece where we can see, looking forwards, quantum technologies are going to help drive efficiency and performance. So thirdly, multi-mode data consolidation. So I've been talking in the context of liver scan, anomalies, output to the clinician. Well, bear in mind, in this day and age, with the number of data points that we have out there, we can access a lot more information in terms of what we can provide the clinician. So things like um, the um, sex of the, uh, the, the candidate, things like, um, say, diet information, um, other illnesses that they might have had over time. So this is an example of multimoda, sorry, multimodal data consolidation. So this is kind of to triage information to say we've spotted an anomaly and it's because of this factor within the patient's lifestyle. So, so again, there are security constraints there. So companies will need to share the data and we'll need to apply quantum technologies to be able to make sure that data can be shared securely. So notwithstanding the factors that we've talked about previously, you can see that we, we, th th there are going to be issues in terms of quantities of data and making sure that the machine learning can take place in a certain amount of time. And then finally, security. So especially with the multimodal data piece, making sure that everyone can be confident that they can contribute the data in a safe and secure manner. So that, yeah, so that, that's us. Any, uh, thank you. <laughs> so I think we have uh, a couple of minutes for questions, if um, maybe one or two questions. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how you leverage quantum for classification? So, so classification, so at the moment, we, we, we base the algorithm on three levels of classification to make it simple, you know, to, make, uh, to ensure the, the algorithm works in its very simplest form. So that's so literally background, liver, and anomaly. So we, we have a team of annotators that, that will take the scans and they will annotate in that very simple way. So if we want to open up the algorithm to be more deep in, term, in terms of, say, a level two or a level three level of classification, we then need our annotators to be able to spot malign tumors, um, sorry, benign tumors and malignant tumors that may be originating in the liver to those that originate externally. So these, these are all additional levels of classification that we're putting into our confusion matrix. So with those additional levels of classification is more in terms of complexity for the, for the machine learning to, to run through. So we're, we're looking at quantum to be able to reduce the machine learning time you know, from potentially um, days, if not months, by adding these additional um, classifications and increasing the complication to, to minutes, if, if not seconds, which is really important um, in, in terms of the volume of data that we're going to have to analyze. Be because, yeah, we're, we're constantly developing the, uh, the algorithm you know, by doing the machine learning runs. Yeah, just to add, you, especially when you're looking at image data, the image data sets, which they're looking at right now, um, doing QFT approaches on that become, opens up a whole different regime for understanding the information. So it's a combination. At the moment, they've focused heavily on the classical approach. And now it's a case of migrating to kind of a uh, QCNN style approach instead. Good. You have a Thank you. It's very interesting. Um, so I'm not quite clear. Is it is this a, like a proof of concept, or have you actually used this with real patients? And if so, can you share any actual out outcome improvements for the patients? 
so at this stage, it's, it is a proof of concept um, to show that the algorithm works. So we, we are in relationships with various clinical organizations. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're, we're looking to expand on that, develop the algorithm, un understand the, uh, the workflow, because if you think about it, you've got a computer company, you've got data scientists, and you've got clinicians. The feedback that I get is that a lot of these projects fail because people can't communicate with each other. So that's why we're being very careful in terms of running a proof of concept and making sure that we design something that's relevant and that can work, say, within the format of the NHS. Sorry, can I ask a related question? How, how do you, does, does the use of quantum computing and the speed increase the error rate or false positives or things like that? Is that also part of this um, study you're doing? So especially when you're looking to kind of queue CNN methods, um, you can do a lot deeper analysis and that's gonna be the focus of it. So at the moment, what Amos has been discussing has predominantly been a classical model. Yeah. But what we're looking to do is migrate that classical model to a QC approach and look at much deeper analysis. So especially because you can run um, uh, higher depth QFTs, uh, you can go through a, a lot more analysis in that, in that workload. So that's going to be the key focus for the next step of the iteration of the algorithm. Right, thank you. So we've we got one more question. One more, for you. okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the, the talk. It was very interesting. So I'm wondering, and I see an opportunity here f to transfer this quantum uh, computing from the liver to maybe the brain for neuroimaging uh, uh, tools and to process that information of the billions of neurons and how they interact between themselves. Is this something that in the long term would be a possibility, I think? Absolutely, you can read my mind. So, we're, we're, so this is where we started. So we started um, in terms of de developing the algorithm around the liver. So we're, we're already in conversation with, um, with clinical customers that say, do you know what, this is all well and good, but where there's a critical need is here or, or here. So we can then look at how we adopt our models to support this new use case. And then with quantum technology as well, um, that, that just adds to the mix. Yeah, just to, just to add on that, I think one of the things in neuroimaging, um, one of the bottlenecks really is around getting um, uh, the voxel size low enough so that you actually understand what's going on at that level, mm. where quantum sensing could potentially open up a whole new area within that field. So I think if we look towards the quantum sensing area getting much better at kind of x-ray CT scans, MRI scans, yeah. and getting kind of high, higher throughput, higher resolution images, only then will we be able to really understand that area. Yeah. The other area of focus could be around um, quantum sensing phys physical electrodes as well, which is being worked on quite heavily in Europe at the moment as well. So if we combine the two approaches, then yes, definitely. But at the moment, I think we're too kind of high level is probably yeah. the best way to put it, to be able to understand really what's going on. That's a very good point. Uh, I second that as well. Quantum sensing is much well suited for the neural rendering and the optimization. So what they're doing is a classification problem at the moment to sort of optimize that entire scheme. But coupled with the uh, quantum sensing application, I think that actually opens up a much more broader neural application. So, yeah. But uh, thank you so much for Perfect. your really interesting and lovely talk and a lot of time. Uh, please give a round of applause.